Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Dear students, hope you all are doing well. Welcome to another very exciting session of the course Soft Tissue Characterization and Applications. Now we are going to switch gears. Uh, we are going to study about a very uh, exciting and new topic which is finite element modeling of tissues. So in order to get to that point where we learn how to do a finite element or computational modeling, uh, we need to understand several different basics and learn a little bit about the software. So let's get started on uh, all the details which we would like to learn for that, right? So, all right. So first of all, before I uh, dive into finite element modeling and that also specific to the soft tissues, I would like to talk very briefly on a few definitions. Uh, biomechanics uh, is an area which we need to understand if we want to dive into soft tissue mechanics, which is a subset or a sub area of biomechanics. So biomechanics basically deals with the study of movement of living body including bones, tissues and organs. So every system inside our body which we are trying to study, whatever movements uh, it undergoes under different forms of loading or speeds, uh, those are all uh, forming the different sections of the biomechanics for the entire body. And overall we have a gait biomechanics, then we have cardiovascular biomechanics then we can have foot biomechanics. So every system in itself has its own biomechanics, okay, which is the study of the movement. So with the knowledge of biomechanics, what can you do? It basically tells you the math or the mathematics behind injury and tissue related disease, which a doctor cannot tell you. So when a doctor experiences uh, or interacts with a patient who has undergone a trauma uh, due to an injury or has been through certain diseases which have caused some tissue changes, uh, the doctor can based on his or her experience tell certain things that this may have happened. But what is the mathematical calculation? How much has the cancerous tumor grown? Or how much is the extent of this injury? Or is this particular tissue bent or notch which has occurred due to an injury, is it very severe? So these kind of decisions cannot be made just from the normal knowledge un unless somebody is very experienced. They have seen all kinds of scenarios in the world, right? But uh, whenever uh, we are talking about the injury and uh, disease scenarios, I am more focused towards medical training, right? So all the budding medical practitioners, doctors, uh, you know, trainees, nurses, they need to be trained in a certain aspect and there needs to be some levels of standardization. We cannot compare them with the expertise of a very senior surgeon. So in order to get all that information that what is correct, what is not, how much is the uh, possibility of uh, an injury, what is the possible uh, mitigation technique, you need to understand the mathematics or some calculations behind it, some quantitative analysis behind it. That is where biomechanics comes into picture, right? So let us take a very uh, quick look into some of the broad categories of uh, biomechanics. The first one is gate biomechanics. So gate biomechanics by its uh, term only um, refers to the gate or the locomotion or the movement of the entire body. So it can uh, basically be seen in form of the different forces and uh, the velocities of every small little point or junctions or joints of our human body, how they are moving. And that is what is being tracked here uh, in, in the terms of skeleton. These are uh, called specific points which do not move, which do not have relative motion. Like this point is not going to have relative motion. This is fixed to my body. So these are fixed points on the body which uh, they are tracked, right? That's the whole gait biomechanics. And you can study this for abnormal gait, somebody with a stroke dysfunction, you know, like there could be so many debilitating diseases which has caused a huge amount of trauma or somebody has got a fall occurrence and has injured their leg. So there are so many different gates which you can experience due to different injury and disease conditions. So that is covered by the gait biomechanics. 
So gate biomechanics uh, attempts to distinguish that what is a normal gate uh, compared to what is an abnormal gate and what could be a possibly better gate. These kind of questions can be addressed in a holistic form, right? The next one is known as sports biomechanics. This is a very exciting and emerging field of research. Uh, so sports biomechanics basically deals with uh, the sports injuries and uh, sport performance. So these are the two terms, sport, sport based injuries and sport based performance. So one is focused on making sure that the athletes and the sportsmen uh, do not get injured, right? So they are playing the sport with the right types of wearables or gears as well as making the right movements so that uh, there are no uh, beyond the uh, ultimate tensile stress kind of, uh, you know, twists or turns which can cause their uh, bones or uh, tissues to rupture, right? So that is for the injury prevention and it can do a lot of gait analysis to look at, uh, you know, like what are the right postures or what are the right techniques of throwing a ball, uh, running and so forth, right? Like there are so many sports and games. The other one is into the performance enhancement. So what should be the right stroke of a swimmer? What should be the right, uh, you know, attempt of a runner who is trying to uh, go for some form of championship or commonwealth championship or something else, right? So what, how can we enhance the performance of that runner through right kind of gait training or biomechanical training? right or uh, could he wear certain shoes or insoles which can make him you know much more comfortable or uh, some clothing and things like that so that that is all part of sports biomechanics right the third area of research and uh, by the way one thing to note is soft tissues are an inherent part of all these different studies of biomechanics be it gait biomechanics or sports biomechanics or the other categories which we are going to explain or discuss as we go so the next one is injury biomechanics. This is a very broad term and can be classified into injury uh, location where uh, things are studied like sometimes you're looking at upper body injury, sometimes extremity injury, you know, like injury to certain organs and things like that. But as a whole, injury biomechanics studies are often observed in car crash tests, right? So any kind of vehicle uh, when it rolls out in the market, it has to undergo certain forms of test in order to uh, comply with the safety standards, right? Still, uh, very interestingly, even after uh, so much advancement in technology, majority of the vehicles are not safe. Even though they have airbags and things like that, uh, if uh, they collide at even a 40 kilometers per hour, there has to be some damage. There will be a damage to the car and there will be some damage to the occupants, right? Some cars are not equipped with uh, backside airbags, so they will have a damage for sure. There could be huge damage to infants and uh, other uh, weak, uh, you know, like candidates who are sitting inside the car. But having said that, like, uh, you know, you want to study the car uh, by not crashing the car. So that's where the injury biomechanics, uh, where finite element modeling is a software tool, which is used for analysis of uh, the mechanics of the car. So we also did this uh, in form of a uh, research, which is going to get published uh, soon. It's on uh, a very detailed work on a Honda Accord model where we are looking at every little part, almost 300 to 400 parts in the car and we are having a full human dummy which is sitting inside the car and uh, we are uh, crashing that car computationally uh, at a 100 kilometers per hour which is one of the industry standards and based on that we are looking at what are the key damage areas. So we are modeling not only the person and the vehicle but also their interactions. So we observed certain things like the person's chest interacting with the steering, the head interacting with the windshield and the uh, feet interacting with uh, you know like the basically the uh, femur interacting, femur bone interacting with certain places in the car dashboard, right? So these are some locations where we find further figured out whether uh, by setting certain injury criteria, whether this person is going to get injured and to what extent is the injury very severe or nominal, right? So these kind of aspects, think about doing it with an experiment with a brand new car where you have some form of dummy. Most of the dummies are still not even 30% uh, accurate, 
to be specific you know like it is much less accurate than that they do not have any tissue representations these are experimental dummies I am talking about they are extremely pricey uh, I have come across dummies which cost like 2 to 3 crores, crores of rupees which I am sure in in our lab we can build them in a few thousands uh, thousands of rupees like maybe 15 20 thousand rupees and they do not have any tissue properties any proper bone properties it is just a bulk dummy so that is being tested in this uh, new models of the car and the car has to be tested up till the destruction right so you are losing not only money you are not getting accurate results so think about doing that experiment five six times like you are losing five or six cars right so that is why the injury biomechanics through a computational model not only you can test it again and again you can test it against different load scenarios one time if you want to car crash the car at 100 kilometers per hour versus like let us say 120 kilometers per hour side crash if, if a truck has to hit the car so there, there are so many instances which you can model right so this gives you a lot of flexibility but of course computational models have their own uh, shortcomings like they have to be validated with some experimental results because few number changes here and there can uh, drastically change the results okay so that is as far as the injury biomechanics category is concerned the next another division is cardiovascular biomechanics where we are specifically looking at the different arteries and uh, this is cardio so you are looking at the human heart and certain arteries uh, stent placements you are looking at the fluid uh, dynamics simulations this is known as computational fluid dynamics where you only do not have a structure you also have a blood flow simulation you are trying to look at the interaction of the blood with the arterial structure and things like that right and uh, what is the overall outcome you want to uh, as a whole understand whether this stent is doing its job correctly whether this amount of clot which is there within this artery needs an operation or is okay to be worked with a stent through angioplasty right so these kind of key decisions can be taken through better understanding of cardiovascular problems right and uh, another very common area of biomechanics is the orthopedic biomechanics that is where you are talking about majorly the bones right so whenever you are talking about bones the tissues are inevitable because they are the ones who are attached to the bones and that is what is causing all the bones to move and perform in a very uh, synchronized fashion so orthopedic biomechanics is a very wide area where majorly you will see a study of tensile and compressive properties of different bones femoral bones like of the femur foot and ankle bones so there are so many bones out there like shoulder bones they are all tested under not only stat quasi static loading at a certain strain rate but also through cyclic and fatigue loadings right many of these things we have already learned but uh, if you can do this computationally the benefit of that is you want to you you will be able to figure out from where exactly the rupture of the bone is going to occur so if two bones are put together with a uh, cartilage then you want to see here through the simulation that how the bones are going to dissociate or which is going to break first how the stress distributions are these kind of things you cannot see through the experiments right so the computational analysis using finite element softwares allows you to look and delve deeper into the problem of understanding soft tissue injury and diseases right so let us go further so let us take a very quick snapshot of experimental biomechanics because we have talked about how computational biomechanics is of real value so we also do not want to undermine the value of experimental biomechanics so let us just take a very quick look into what it is what are the capabilities and some of the shortcomings right so uh, the first shortcoming of experimental biomechanics is it is limited by biosafety and ethical constraints so if you have to take due ethical clearance and it has to be approved by the committee whether you can do that kind of test there are certain stringent protocols which you have to follow how to dispose the tissue how to procure the tissue store the tissue there are n number of other rules and regulations which have to be there right so if you are looking at a cadaveric tissue experiment as you can see in the figure on the top left they are placed in a biaxial kind of machine uh, so here uh, it may seem that I could just take the piece of this cadaveric bone set and place it in the system and uh, measure the load deformation it is not that easy you have to take a lot of clearances precautions you cannot be placing a cadaver in your lab you have to 
take it from a certain location like a morgue and then uh, there are certain other constraints like fresh cadavers have a very un uh, similar property to the actual uh, human uh, bones or tissues but once the cadaver has degraded over time or it is old it's been staying there for a few months it's going to change this tissue properties so it may not give you the accurate results right so cadaveric tissue experiments for example are a little challenging if, if, even though they are done as a gold standard in across the research labs some places it is very difficult to get access to the cadavers and second is getting the right protocols or ethical clearances to get these kind of research done think about a startup company they cannot get so much so many things done unless they tie up with the hospital right the next example which is very commonly used for research is known as a experimental gate analysis in this uh, gate analysis what you have is you have a very expensive lab uh, I, the reason I call this expensive is because of the equipments uh, which this lab has. This is uh, at least 8 to 16 motion capture cameras. This is at least 8 to 16 motion capture cameras and uh, these are known as infrared or IR cameras, uh, fairly expensive. You could think of like around four to eight thousand dollars a piece at least. Yeah. And majority of these cameras are not built in India. So they have to be procured from abroad and that attracts a lot of cost of shipping as well as uh, you know conversions and foreign taxes right so uh, then you have uh, you need a certain amount of space to make a walkway so that a person can basically uh, walk back and forth right so the person can walk back and forth uh, and another thing is you need uh, specialized markers to be placed on the uh, body of the person so that his gait can be tracked through those IR cameras. So this overall specialized device along with a very sophisticated software which is going to track the gait and post process the data uh, into a nice uh, kind of uh, moving of the points with the lines kind of the entire gait data uh, by calculating the forces. Uh, forces have to be measured using a force play platform which is an extra added cost. They have to be placed in the walkway. Uh, so you have to calculate the forces, velocities, displacements, accelerations, these kind of all details measured together will have an overall cost of around 250000 to three $300,000, like more than a crore, um, 1 to 1 1.5 crores of investment, right? This is not possible in a regular research lab or somebody who has just started out their research lab. You may be later uh, stage of your research, you may be able to do this, right? So experimental biomechanics, it's very uh, challenging to study due to the cost constraints and other, uh, you know, availability constraints, availability of equipments and things like that, right? Another example is exercise training. Uh, so these kind of training equipments are used to understand your body vitals and uh, like, for example, your oxygen limits and how your heart beats while you're doing performing certain exercises in a certain way in a aggressive way or non-aggressive way so these kind of devices are also very very expensive so majority of the imported devices which you uh, use in the indian context are going to be expensive almost double or triple the cost of using them in their native country right so this definitely calls for a lot of entrepreneurial ventures where uh, these kind of devices can be made low cost in line with the Make in India initiative like you know and that will really uh, improve the scenario and maybe experimental biomechanics can then be conducted at a much more uh, coherent manner across labs in India right. Another uh, key question here to answer about experimental biomechanics can we study these three phenomena experimentally. The first example is a blast injury. Can you subject a person to a blast and study what happens to that person or what happens to the armor he is wearing? That is totally unethical. None of the boards will ever approve that. That's total, You could end up killing that person. So that's not possible. So you can only study blast through computational modeling. That's your only option which is left. The next example is slips and falls, right? Can you just push a person down the, uh, you know, like down the stairs or push push him down like on a flooring with a slippery contaminant and just run some slip and fall experiments. Yes, they are done. They are known as controlled human slipping experiments, but in a very sophisticated gate lab. So it's very difficult to uh, do slip and fall experiments which are unexpected and realistic uh, with, within the ethical constraints, right? The third is the armor testing or testing of ballistics. Uh, 
So historically what used to happen was uh, they, there would be a person who would be wearing the armor and there is another person who shoots onto that person uh, wearing that armor. Uh, that is what this armor testing picture shows you and it's in black and white which indicates that it's, it's, it's a while back, right? It's probably 50, 60 years back. So you can no more do that, right? Like it's it's highly unethical. If you miss the mark, if you're going to, you're going to kill the person, and uh, that person can also get really fatal injuries, right? So uh, right now your options are uh, you want to either hit a dummy uh, with the ballistics or develop certain soft tissue simulants, which can be hit with the uh, you know like different kinds of bullets to study uh, what is the effect. So this is a fairly open area and that is where computational biomechanics also comes into picture. You can easily do this computation uh, through dynamic analysis in a software rather than having to worry about the experiments, right? Okay, further into the computational biomechanics, now we have understood the importance of computational biomechanics and how experimental uh, biomechanics has its own constraints and uh, challenges. So. Uh, computational biomechanics allows us to study very, very complex injuries and organ pathologies. Pathologies is like a diseased organ, like where a tissue is changing. Uh, here are some examples like I have explained the car crash testing. You are looking at a very similar car, uh, you know, like dummy which, uh, which is car model which has a very descriptive set of car parts like as close as possible to a real car and you have some occupants sitting within that occupant models and you're studying the interaction while this car is going to crash into a, um, a wall. What are the interactions, how the car is getting damaged, how the uh, occupants are getting damaged and how the interactions are happening, right? Next is uh, ballistic testing like I've just mentioned. So in a uh, real life ballistic testing, if you were to do it on a simulant or any other form of, uh, you know, dummies, you cannot study what is happening inside the body, right? You can only study the outer impact or outer conclusion. What may happen if a bullet hits a head? What is going to happen in different sections of the head, the skull, brain, skin, what all different aspects or the backside if there is a back spatter and things like that. These are some common terms uh, when you're wearing a armor like a helmet. So what all things are going to possibly damage the head and how the damage is going to be? Based on that you can devise armors and things like that. That cannot be studied experimentally right now. At least to date like nothing has been developed so high with such a high fidelity which, which can study the uh, ballistic interaction between the uh, human body and the uh, bullets, right? So but you can do it quite well with the computational models. So there has been a lot of computational models out there in the market uh, in the research arena where they have very detailed models of the brain, the cerebrospinal fluid, the skull, the skin, the different sections of the brain, the brain arteries and how a bullet is going to interact with all these different segments when it is point blank versus when it is at a distance versus like when it is coming from a certain direction. So all these very detailed studies you can just do by understanding finite element modeling in a detailed way, right? Like it is a very uh, like wide field to study finite element modeling in itself. In this uh, course, I am going to basically show you a very short glimpse of uh, how you can create a finite element model using a free software and uh, how you can study soft tissue mechanics using the same. So that's, that's my purpose in the context of soft, soft tissue mechanics, we would like to learn the finite element software, right? But uh, having said that, it is a very wide area. There are studies on the computational fluid dynamics, dynamic impact analysis. They require a very different skill sets and uh, set of study and experience to operate with. So in no way am I trying to teach all of that, right? Like I'm just giving a very short brief intro into the finite element model. Another area which, uh, which is of interest is spinal injury analysis. This is an organ pathology where there has been an injury or disease in the spinal segment and you want to study for a daily loading and unloading whether you are uh, sitting with the correct posture or uh, leaning or uh, you know like uh, you are doing certain activities like climbing stairs and all. How these activities and all the loads generated due to these activities are going to affect this uh, deformed or the degraded or the diseased section of the spine, right? This is of 
importance and this can be studied through computational biomechanics using finite element modeling. Also uh, besides the study of complex injuries and organ pathologies, you should be able to study interventions or medical devices, interactions with a lot of devices and wearables can also be studied. Like an arterial stent implantation, here is a figure where you are looking at an arterial vessel model, this is built in finite element modeling. You have a model of the plaque which is a clot inside the artery, you have a stent which is uh, sent through angioplasty but here you can through uh, computational modeling insert that stent and there is a balloon which uh, this is known as balloon angioplasty which opens up the stent. So while placement of the stent you are trying to look at the different stresses which are occurring at different sections of the artery, right. So this arterial stent implantation can be uh, studied in depth using computational biomechanics. Another example is the ballistic helmet testing. While a person is uh, possibly wearing a helmet, when a bullet hits the helmet, what are the different interactions? How does the helmet interact with the head and how the different segments of the head interact with each other, right? And finally, the outcome is does these kind of interactions lead to death or a very severe injury? That is to be understood. And that is how you can reiterate or improvise the model of the helmet to make sure uh, that the helmet is able to give the right protection against uh, any sort of injury, severe injury. And uh, you'll, you can look at the model as a whole uh, with the helmet and uh, the face as well as in a very detailed fashion where different segments of the brain and the face and the other soft tissues which we have talked about are all defined and their interactions are all defined, right. So, what are the key steps of a computational biomechanics? Now we have learned the importance of computational biomechanics. Let us slowly take baby steps into understanding uh, what are the key steps uh, which are involved and these are all executed using a finite element software, right. The name itself finite element uh, specifies that the entire body or a model or a system is basically broken down into very small, small pieces which are known as elements. This is very widely popular science which has basically allowed us to study stresses and strains when somebody is touching at this part of my body, what is going on in the other part let us say on my head or let us say on my foot. I can never study that using regular mechanics or just the basic physics understanding, right. But finite element modeling allows us to break the entire body model. If, if my body model was used for computational analysis into small, small elements and within this elements the realistic calculation, finite element calculations are performed on the back end and this finally tells you that if somebody touches my hand or applies a load on my hand, will this have some minimal effect on my head and shoulder and other portions of my body. So this science has become increasingly important because you can study not only human bodies but extremely complex structures, what is happening within that structure and what may have lead to possible failure. That is what we are all interested in, right? What may have lead, led to a very poor injury, right? Things like that, right? So the first step of a finite element modeling is basically imaging or scanning or the need to have a model basically. So first of all, you need a model to work on, right? This model could either be designed by you like you model a box, right? Or uh, you have modeled something on a CAD software by placing hundreds and thousands of points or you do some imaging and scanning which auto captures those points and creates a model, it creates a 3D model. So that is the initial input for a finite element software, okay? So here I am taking an example of something which we did as a part of our own research is uh, we took a uh, human foot like so this was a participant who basically um, uh, volunteered his foot and we have had him like uh, wear a sock and on that sock we placed a lot of points like around uh, 800, 900 points at different locations and then we had him stand uh, and after a while sit with his uh, feet pretty uh, you know like fixed and we had a nice cardboard box where we had three rulers from that we were uh, going to measure the x, y, z coordinates of each of these points on the sock, right. By assuming that uh, the vertex, uh, vertex from which the x, y, z coordinates are uh, located that is the 0, 0, 0 point, right. So once we have taken all those points down of the foot, 
So, we remodeled that or uh, threw that into a CAD software and that's, that led us to create this geometrical model. This is from an actual research of our group. And when we uh, rendered the geometrical model, uh, rendering is an easier term, it is more uh, difficult than uh, you know like done. So, basically uh, with the geometrical model you need to convert this into a volume model and finally you need to discretize or break down this volume using certain operations into finite elements which are small small volumes right. Uh, so, uh, geometrical model was built into a finite element model and this was followed by application of load. So, the red region in the uh, picture uh, green picture of the foot uh, basically describes the loading which was applied. So, let us say if I am 60 kilograms of weight I am going to apply 30 kilograms of weight distributed evenly or uh, in form of a pressure in, in this location right. So, once this is applied I want to also apply a constraint so that there is a ground on which the foot is applying the pressure and then finally, I can look at what is going underneath the foot. How what is the pressure distribution when this foot with a certain amount of loading is interacting with the ground right just as if we are standing right. So, uh, this is the final set of results through the simulation what you get. In uh, a unit like megapascal, we are looking at the stresses, uh, stress distribution underneath the foot. Typically, this is high towards the places or zones which touch the ground firmly, like the heel or the uh, the arch doesn't touch it, so you see very little stresses located there. But the uh, frontal part, which is the ball of the foot or the toe region, just below the metatarsal, that is in contact with the ground, so that will uh, give uh, pretty high stress values. So, this, this is a kind of a foot map which you would notice. You can see a very similar foot map if you just put your foot in water and kind of step onto an A4 size sheet paper and just step off right like then you will see a very similar map of your foot like uh, which basically shows the high stress points right. So, very, very similar story like finite element software is kind of used to take you through this different stages uh, from the modeling stage all the way to the simulation stage where you can apply different sorts of loading. Uh, so, if a person weighs 80 kilograms I can again apply that right uh, proportional loading of 40 kilograms. Of a person is like uh, kind of limping is a certain uh, kind of way of standing right those kind of loads can be applied right. So, this is what computational biomechanics allows us to do to, to have a lot of flexibility uh, using a finite element software which is of course, it is very challenging to learn. Finite element software needs a good bit of attention and introduction before you can use it like a pro right. So, further um, a little bit delving into the FE model. So, what a finite element model essentially does is it breaks down the entire volume into small small elements. Now, this volume in order to run a simulation needs two things which are extremely important for all of you to take a note. One is at least one constraint or one fixed point or a fixed line. One fixed point may not be good enough at least three fixed points or a fixed area or a fixed line right. So, if your model is not fixed in a software the software assumes that it is a freely floating model and it will not solve the problem right. So, you need at least some fixed constraints even if you do not have a load the model will still run, but will not give you any valuable output, but then you have to apply the load and this elements within this elements all this mathematical equations are happening and it is trying to find a solution and finally, you get a good solution of the stresses, strains, displacements, uh, forces everything which you get right. So, uh, typically uh, what is a finite element meshing? Meshing is the process of breaking down or discretizing the entire volume into small small elements that is the process step right. So, you have the option of choosing how many elements you want to have not that you have a very stringent option of saying I want 3005 elements. You cannot go that stringent you can probably have something in the order of 3000 to 3500 elements if you control the size pretty well like of the elements right. So, let us say uh, you want to go with a very small number of elements that makes your mesh very coarse right. If you want to go with a very high number of elements let us say 30,000 plus it makes your mesh or the number of elements very high, but the sizes of the elements decreases that is a smooth mesh right. 
So what is the benefit or uh, shortcoming of uh, a coarse versus smooth mesh? So this is what this picture depicts. Uh, the second picture here, basically with a coarse mesh, the accuracy goes drastically down, but the time of simulation or computation also drastically goes down, right? However, with a very, very smooth mesh, the accuracy goes extremely high, but the time also gets extremely high. So could you afford running a simulation for three or four days, right? Or do you want to complete this in like maybe 30 minutes or two hour simulation? So you have to have some optimal mesh in between, not go very smooth, not go very coarse, which can give you enough accuracy result like along with a optimal amount of time which is reasonable. So the process of obtaining that is known as a mesh convergence study which I will explain briefly in one of the upcoming sessions. Uh, so just I would just request your attention into understanding all, your, all the details and steps of the finite element modeling. Second is assignment of loads, constraints and contacts. So there are three things which will uh, be part of the different meshes. So let us say you have a foot, you have an insole, right? So the foot will have its own mesh, the insole will have its own mesh associated with two different material properties as well. There needs to be a constraint on the uh, insole at least which is constrained to the ground, right? And if the foot is not constrained anywhere foot is going to interact with the insole, there needs to be a contact condition which is defined between the foot and the insole, right? Now it is okay, the foot is uh, being applied some load width like and then uh, with this load there is a load transfer from the foot to the insole which is fixed to the ground and then the simulation can run, right? So loads, constraints and contacts are fairly important for all sorts of finite element simulations, right? You can have different forms of loading like force loading, displacement loading, pressure loading, uh, all these I am going to explain in uh, good depth, right? Next is uh, I have already explained contact with the foot and fix, fixing to the ground. Uh, these are the minimal requirements to do a foot insole simulation. Assignment of material properties, this is also very important, right? You want to make sure that the right material properties are assigned to the foot right material properties are assigned to the insole. Insole is a very easy material model. You could assign an elastic material property with certain modulus even though it is a soft material within a certain strain uh, zone like or strain range it is going to behave pretty linearly. So that is great you know like you can assign a mod simple modulus of elasticity or some hyper elastic models to the uh, insole. However, think about a foot foot has a lot of different bones, different cartilages, different uh, forms of uh, ligaments as well as different muscle segments and finally the skin. Can you describe foot with a single material property? You cannot, right? It is highly inaccurate but we have done that previously. So that brings us to a part which is known as assumptions for your computational model. Computational model cannot ever be as real as possible to the live system, right? If the structures are nicely defined, there is some compromise on the materials. I may not be able to define an isotropy. I may not be able to define all the different segments and sections of a model. Sometimes I will have to assume that this is the overall property of the foot or overall property of either the bone and the muscles, soft tissue of the foot and things like that. So you cannot go very well in depth that this bone I am going to put this property, this bone I am going to do this property, this fascia that property. You can do that but that is a very, very complex model. Typically uh, people do their PhDs in uh, finite element modeling where they are basically looking at a certain problem trying to define every small little bone, cartilage and uh, tissue like right with the material property. Finally, after assignment of material properties, loads, constraints and contacts, you run an analysis and then you have to do some post processing to look at the results, right? So uh, this is how an FE analysis result looks like. This is just uh, to be used as an example. It is from one of the published articles uh, uh, our, of our own group. So here we are trying to look at uh, diabetic ulcerations on the foot. Basically what I have here is. Uh, two ulcers like on the foot and I am trying to apply some pressures on this foot by having its interaction with different insoles and barefoot. And I am trying to develop as a goal 
here some insoles which can offload some pressure on the ulcer so that the ulcer does not degrade it it has a possibility of healing right so that's that was the purpose of this research uh, so this not only led us to a patent but also led us to quite a few publications so uh, let us look at some of the results here uh, so we have tested different materials on the insole and uh, which are given on the x axis on the y axis you're looking at the maximum von mises stress which is uh, located or measured at the plantar foot region which is the bottom foot region right you want to minimize this maximum stress as well as have a nice distribution right majority of the models will perform fine if the maximum stress is reduced and the distribution of stresses are uniform this is these are the rules of thumb right whenever you have a very high stress zone followed by a low stress zone that is an area where fractures or ruptures can occur but uniformly distributed loads are nice right in a normal foot that is the case right okay so uh, what we studied here was uh, a foot without the ulcer, uh, foot with the ulcer, foot with an insole, foot with an insole with an isolation kind of design where the ulcer is isolated with a hole. Uh, so these kind of very uh, different complex designs were studied and finally uh, we could look at the stress strain distributions, we could study the effect of material properties on the results uh, when we change the material of the insole. We could identify injury or disease specific strains, stresses and strains in this case for the diabetes, right. We could also look at the effect of interventions which are insoles uh, on stresses and strains. So, this is the area in which uh, finite element modeling allows you to delve into not only the disease models or the disease tissues or the injured tissues, but also interaction of devices. Uh, you know interventions, needles, medical implants, all these different models uh, with the soft tissue. What is going to happen due to that? Like classic hip, hip implant is another example where a lot of finite element modeling works are conducted, right. So the final result along with the research and analysis led us to this orthotic intervention or an insole based intervention where we were able to develop a patented insole composition with a certain material along with a shape. Uh, and isolation for the ulcer which was unique and uh, beneficial for the ulcer offloading as well as for betterment and better healing in general like better healing of the ulcer wound right. So these are some wide range of things which you can learn and uh, you know study through finite element analysis. So having said that we are going to talk now uh, about the software ANSYS. So, uh, this uh, software is a very uh, historical software, it has been in use for the last 20-25 years even uh, probably more uh, uh, as per as the best, best of my knowledge. Uh, this has been primarily used in structural analysis solutions for civil engineering, mechanical engineering problems historically uh, to understand uh, whether a pillar is going to bear the load of the building, things like that. And uh, recent years, in the last 15 or 20 years, they have been extensively applied in uh, biomechanics research for understanding of soft tissue as well as heart tissue degradation, uh, disease, uh, injury models and things like that, right. So this is the software which we are going to use. Uh, so I am going to show you in the next slides how you can download the ANSYS student version which is available for free online, right. So, uh, this way all of us can uh, be on the same patch. Please do practice on this software at least the things which I teach and uh, you are welcome to then watch the videos uh, and uh, re-practice and make sure you are able to work on the soft tissue simulations, right. So, this is the platform which we are going to look at in a few minutes. Uh, I am going to just uh, take a few sessions on the software itself and I would like to familiarize you with the different aspects of the software. Uh, what options are what and how to go from uh, uh, the scratch. Uh, we are going to learn very much from scratch assuming nobody has ever seen a software similar to this or has any experience with any CAD based or mechanical software, right. So with that limited knowledge we are going to start from there and learn about the software together, okay. So this is how you are going to find uh, the software. Just go to Google, uh, just write down ANSYS student version right. So, this will show you a bunch of results, click on the very top result, right. This will lead you to the next page. This is the ANSYS student version uh, page, uh, 
uh, where it is written ANSYS for students. So uh, very kindly I think ANSYS has allowed its student version to be used for students across the uh, you know different industries or uh, the uh, institutes and this is around the world and otherwise ANSYS is a paid software it's it's an expensive software of course this um, free software is more of like a demo version like a little more than the demo version uh, which doesn't have a lot of capabilities if you're going for very very complex simulations but it will still do the job uh, for majority of the things we are learning and we are trying to imp uh, implement right so you go for this page next and uh, you have to scroll uh, a little down uh, as you scroll down like you will get to this option where it is written free student software downloads right under this you go for the first option which is ANSYS student free download now once you click free download now it lets you choose what kind of windows you have is it 64 or 64 bit or 34 uh, 32 bit uh, you would majority of the computers and laptops come in 64 bits this these days so you can select that it will download at least 2 to 3 GB of the software and then it needs to be installed typically takes a while uh, you would need some space in your laptop or computer and almost uh, an hour uh, long of uh, installation time right so this is how you get to answer student version and you can download and use it for free right so i would just encourage all of you to do the same uh, so that we can practice on what we learn going from here right so uh, uh, yeah that's all for the slides i'm going to now switch gears and jump to the software okay okay so how you start the software you go to your windows if you are using windows you type apdl okay once you have installed the software so ANSYS comes in two versions one is known as uh, the workbench which is much more closer to the CAD software SOLIDWORKS the second one is an APDL right APDL platform will look a little bit like uh, the 1990s DOS version kind of when uh, we used to look at computers with a black screen right so that is when it was historically developed and very popular but the good part with why we learn APDL is it has better controls in terms of meshing and like you know modeling and sometimes simulation and uh, meshing is a very unique and important part of uh, the software so that is given by the ANSYS APDL that's why we industrially if you look at anybody who is working on softwares and analysis they are all using ANSYS APDL workbench is typically used um, for sync with CAD data and it's a little easier use right so that has to be used in that way okay so uh, once you click this the next thing which happens is the ANSYS uh, starts so it is going to show you a screen like this right so this is the first screen which you are going to look out uh, so we are going to go here and learn everything about the software platform from scratch so just pay attention and be with me as we learn through the different aspects of uh, the software and uh, go from scratch into learning how to do some simulations with the soft tissue right so uh, it is a good idea to use a mouse uh, while you're doing that uh, because uh, you would have to do some operations like pan zoom rotate and uh, you're trying to do a few things uh, move things here and there so it's a good idea to use a mouse while you're using ANSYS right another thing is uh, there is no undo option in ANSYS uh, so you cannot go back to where you started or where you have probably done some mistake uh, in a certain step so it's a good idea to save ANSYS every now and then right so uh, that is the first option here so this is the top panel where uh, the points of interest are file select list plot plot controls uh, these are the first five uh, options which are of interest this is the main menu and the other ones can be skipped for now they are used for usually advanced uh, modeling so we are going to skip them for now so I'm going to focus on only those uh, uh, buttons and pointers which are of use to us for capturing a very quick crash course on uh, learning answers right so you go to file you have the option of save as so if you save the file at any point it typically directs you to either of your directories right you can select C or D drive so I am in C drive 
So I can select any file or uh, write a name of a file. Typically the file gets saved in the form of .db which is uh, uh, representing database, .database file known as a database file. So make sure that .db still exists. You are not deleting the entire thing and writing something down, right? So once you save this, this is going to get saved and uh, you can basically resume from where you have saved it. You can select that file which is uh, saved and you can resume your simulation from there. So under the file, two, three things are important. The first one is a clear and start new. This basically allows you to clear uh, your screen. If you remember back in the day, like we used to have a clear screen option in C++ and uh, other softwares which we use. So you can have a clear screen option uh, and based on that, like uh, you can refresh everything and start from scratch, right? Uh, working on your simulation. Everything beforehand which you had been working on in the software vanishes. Okay. So another thing to note that these are some note points to be taken is ANSYS doesn't have any units. ANSYS APDL doesn't have any units. So whatever we consider as the unit, the, you are going to get the results in the same proportion. So as a rule of thumb, any kind of lengths, we are talking about length, breadth, width, uh, the length of the line or any kind of edge length and things like that are always to be considered in millimeters. That's just a rule of thumb because you cannot be, most of the organs you would not draw them in meters, right? You would, uh, centimeters is not an SI unit. So usually we use millimeters, right? All the uh, forces are measured in Newtons, okay? So all the stresses, pressures, right? Pressure is given by force upon area, which is known as Newtons upon meter square, which is uh, the standard unit which is known as Pascal's, right? Pascal's, uh, if you look up pressure or stress, you will see Pascal is Newton's upon meter square. But we are going to consider everything in millimeters. So if you convert meter into millimeter, it's 10 raised to power negative three. Square of that in the denominator, did from the denominator comes to the numerator. So it becomes mega Pascal's, right? So when you consider your forces in Newton's, your um, uh, measurements and age lengths in all uh, millimeters only, all your pressure, stresses and other values are going to come in megapascals, okay? There is a term known as modulus of elasticity which we have explained in previous sessions which is nothing but the stress upon strain. Stress upon strain, strain is unitless, stress has a unit of pascal or megapascal in this case. So modulus of elasticity again comes with the megapascal unit, right? So these are the units we should keep in mind. So whenever we are looking at the results of stresses, these are all coming in 2, 3, 5, 6, whatever it is in megapascals, right? So keeping this thumb rules in mind, let us get started uh, looking into the different tabs. So the very top tab is where you have file, select, list, plot, plot controls. I'm going to explain all of these as we go, uh, you know, like using the list option, you can list the different key points, key points are the points which you are using to create a model. You can list the lines, you can list the areas, list the volumes. By listing we mean it is listed in like a sheet. It is written that this line goes from this to this point has a length of this much. This point has a coordinate of x, y, z, 2, 3, 4 or something like that, right? So this is how the key points are uh, selected. If you list lines, it is going to show this to this point, this is the length, list areas, these are the lines which are forming that area. I am going to show and take examples of all that, right? So listing basically lets you list in a sheet. How is this beneficial? I will tell you. Whenever we are trying to find out whether this line or surface was a part of this volume, it, it gets really beneficial. Plot is an important option where this is, uh, this has the same options as the list almost. We can look at specifically the key points or the lines or the areas or the volumes or multiplots which gives us everything or we can even look at the elements after meshing, right? Plot controls gives you some finer options of plotting and uh, rest of the things which we are going to skip. Help option has a lot of tutorials which you can go through and there are a lot of other YouTube videos which will show you different forms of answers but this will give you a nice glimpse and refresher into how to model a soft tissue. 
this tab in between uh, is basically a command prompt uh, just do not touch this prompt right this is for folks who had been historically writing commands to work on ANSYS they write commands like in C++ they have all written commands and that is how they work on ANSYS. So, whenever you do certain operations in ANSYS when you do any click or move the mouse it is going to generate an equivalent command which you can see on the back end like there is this black uh, back end output window where you can see all these commands if you are interested. The other options here are the uh, save option you have a quick save analysis option you have uh, some other options majority like print image capture options and things like that pan zoom rotate option new analysis open mechanical APDL file things like that majority of these options I never use in this tab. The other tab here are save database file it is a quick click resume database file quit and power graph power graph I usually never use right. Now, the other areas or tabs of interest are this main menu you are going to spend maximum of your time in this main menu which will give you all the tools for modeling, meshing, loading, analysis uh, everything right. So, we are going to spend a lot of time on this main menu learning every basic step by step. This is the screen in between where you have the XYZ coordinate system uh, this is not typically always black you can set it to white or some other background colors right. This is where majority of your operations will happen all your modeling meshing and everything. So, the last thing is the right side tab where you have different options like views, views option like an isometric view, oblique view, right view, top view, side view how you want to look at your model and these are all with respect to the coordinate system. You have an option of fit view if you somehow go out of the window you can fit view and it will bring your model back to the window. You have option of zooming, rotating by certain angles, doing different things to the model. One thing which is of importance is this dynamic model mode right which I would always like to keep on while wor working with ANSYS. So, if I switch this on this allows me to use my mouse the left click as I hold my mouse to pan this the scroller to zoom and the right side one to rotate right right click it is not a click I am holding the click right. So, dynamic model mode lets me work on this window very effectively. So, this is a good introduction to the software uh, you know tabs we are going to pick it up from here and learn about one of the very interesting simulations as a starting simulations let us learn about all these tabs and how we can generate a full simulation in the next session right. So, thank you all.